Hi guys, welcome back to another video in the DIY CNC build series. I hope you all had a great Christmas and are having a great start to the new year. I took a little break as it's been a month since the last update video, but I've always been thinking about this project and particularly this part here which you see next to me and how I wanted to lay this out for optimal wiring and just the most efficient way possible. So in today's video, I'm gonna share with you my thoughts and planning on how I put this together. Now bear in mind, this isn't gonna be a video where I show you where every single wire goes and, and how to do all that. I've explained in the past that I'll teach you how to wire up the steppers and the Mac 3 board, which I've already done in prior videos where I showed you how to test all that on the bench. But in terms of the power electronics and that kind of thing, it's kind of down to you to get that sorted. You can see here the enclosure is next to me. It's completed, I can switch it on. I have all the connectors coming out the back here. It's completely modular. So it can run like this with nothing connected to it. If I ever need to move the machine around or move it to a different location in the future, I can just pull out all the connectors and move the machine wherever I want. So that has been part of my design process and I kind of walk you through that in this video. So. I'll stop rambling on and we'll dive straight into the video. So I hope you enjoy. Right guys, so we're back here at the CNC and the goal today obviously is to get the electronics installed and all wired up. I've pretty much decided this is how I'm gonna lay everything out. You can see I've made a few changes here which I'll explain in a second, but I've got my three fuses in here now. I've got the 10 amp and the two separate three amp fuses. 10 amp will power the spindle one of the three amps will power the control electronics including the two power supplies here the NEMA drivers and these sort of boards and then the other three amp fuse is dedicated just for this um, Intel Nook mini PC here my emergency stop here and my selector switch is going to be on the outside of the enclosure mounted very close to the fuses obviously because they're going to be connected there before heading off to the power supplies I've also purchased some of these connectors here I have six pin connectors for the encoders and I have some four pin connectors and three pin connectors so basically like I said in the last video I want everything to be very modular so I'm going to have the female end of these connectors on the outside of the enclosure then run into wherever they need to go and from the outside I'm going to have the male end of those connectors I can just plug in so I can quick connect or disconnect whenever I want to. That should make everything a lot cleaner and it means I won't have to keep coming in here and changing things if I ever want to move it around. The other thing I said I've changed here as you can see is I've added a bit of height here um, mainly because I wanted to mount the Intel Nook PC underneath to save space. So I had this on eBay for £30. You know, it's nothing special. It runs Windows 7 32 bit. I think it's got 4 gig of RAM and it's quad core. So it's not terrible. Definitely capable of running Mac 3 or any other control software. And it's not going to do a lot in here. You know, it's got uh, USBs out, which obviously to connect to this. It has an ethernet port and I'm not even going to use a keyboard or mouse or HDMI with this thing because what I plan to do and what I've done for my 3018 CNC as well, I'm simply going to install real VNC on here which lets you remote to the computer from another device. So I have an old iPad, iPad mini 2, which again I had on eBay a few years ago for 20 quid. I can have the iPad mini 2 remote into this and control everything on a touch screen so it eliminates the need for a monitor extra wires I don't need a keyboard and mouse I can just control everything off an iPad remote into this machine so that's my goal there it does mean I need internet connection to this I that you can either use a Wi-Fi USB dongle which would obviously need to be outside the enclosure because Wi-Fi isn't going to work very well in a metal box or there's an ethernet port. You can run ethernet direct in here, which is probably what I'll do for reliability. As you can see, I've 3D printed my own bracket to mount the nook here to the back plate. It didn't come with one, but it does have two mounting holes on the back. So I just designed one of these quickly in Fusion 360, printed it out, bolted the nook on from the back, and then bolted the bracket from the front here. 
uh, which works lovely. I have plenty of space behind as well and nothing is touching the back of the enclosure when this goes on. And then you can see I've also designed and 3D printed these little standoffs which simply go on these M10 threads here. I had a spare M10 threaded bar lying around. I cut these to size, re-threaded them, obviously where they were cut. And these serve perfectly, you know, these will just go straight on here. And then I also had this piece of acrylic lying around. So, I've, you know, I've tried to use as much as I can that I've just got in the workshop. I've drilled these holes out, obviously, to match the ones underneath. And this will simply sit on here. There we go. And then from there, I can mount all my electronics on the top. And I think that's a really great solution. These will be on standoffs as well, bolted to the perspex on the back. I also have these domed M10 nuts then to go on the top to hold everything in place. You could even 3D print some of these if you really wanted to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this is potentially the best way to go. Mainly because, as I've said in prior videos, I may change the control board to something else in the future. And in this particular case, because the rest of the components are generally going to stay the same and the way they're wired, the only wiring that would need to change is the one between this and the other control electronics, such as the NEMAs, you know, the sensors will interface to this board. None of this stuff's going to change. So if I ever wanted to change my control board, all I need to do is take this off, get a new piece of acrylic, drill some new holes, mount my new board on, and that's plug and play, literally. So I'm really happy with this approach. I've saved space by having the nook underneath. I can route wires under here as well. Like there's, there's just so many options. And as you guys know, I'm gonna be using these sort of terminal blocks as well, which I can either mount on here, I can mount them underneath. They can go on the sides down here next to the mini PC. Just have so many more options and it doesn't feel crammed. I've got loads of room to run cables. I can put cable connectors as well, which I've also got. You can see here are some zip tie pads, which you can zip tie connectors to. And it should all be ready to go. I've also had all the cable arrive too. So I've gone for all shielded cable. Even the mains in is shielded. The full core out to the spindle is shielded. All my signal connections are shielded. I've just gone for shielded everything, mainly because it's just gonna help reduce those potential issues in the future if this VFD is gonna cause problems inside the unit itself. It is completely possible that this is gonna just generate so much frequency that it may have to be mounted externally. And if that's the case, then we can look at that. But I want to try it like this to start with, see how it goes. Like I said, that's the beauty of doing this yourself. You can change anything at any time and it's completely up to you how you want to do it. So yeah, from here, I mean, I have everything I need. I'm now going to head over to the enclosure. I'll show you that and some of the air intake stuff that I'm going to have to do. And yeah, from there, I'm just going to start installing things and I'll try and document it as best as I can. Obviously, I want to make sure it's safe and done correctly. So I'll do my best to capture everything. So one of the first things I'm just gonna do here is get everything mounted down to the backboard. There are a couple of things that I can secure down, like the power supplies. Uh, obviously I wanna make sure first that it will fit straight into the box because I've maximized the size here so it kinda needs to go in at an angle and then like tilt in. So as long as nothing gets in the way here of that being able to happen, otherwise I'll have to mount these when it's installed. But one of the beauties of putting it on a backboard like this is I can do the wiring here, right? It's a lot trickier to do wiring when it's in a box like that because the light doesn't get in there very well. It's a bit awkward. You end up leaning over, it hurts your back. Whereas with this, you know, I've got my mounting holes, which then bolt to the control box so in terms of the intricate wiring at the top here between these boards that can be done 
up here. Pretty straightforward. The power electronics obviously will be done when it's installed, but I can run wires from here to the power supplies. I can run them to the VFD. All I need to do then is connect my mains input into the fuses. So you just want to try and make your life as easy as possible, really. So that's the way I'm going to approach this. I've also got to go over to the enclosure and drill out holes for a lot of these connectors. So I've got a 20 mil bit here that's designed for metal. But then these should just fit straight in. I bought some O-rings as well, which should help install these. And like I said, I can do the wiring and it should be good fun. Right guys, so there it is. I've installed all the hardware onto the board here. As I said, I've left plenty of room for running some cables to mount the switches on the side here. And I've now secured the boards down as well. And I think I've maximized the control box as much as I can. I've spread everything out. One thing worth noting as well, a couple of people may be concerned that the power supply has a fan on the back here. As you can see down there, that is generally an outtake. However, I've opened the power supply up and turned that fan around so the air is an intake. And then it'll come out at the top here. Now the reason I've done that is because in my control box, I'm going to have two intake fans at the bottom of the enclosure. And I wouldn't want that to be essentially throwing air out towards a fan that's drawing air in. So ideally, you know, this will get cool air sent straight through it, which is ideal. And that will then vent up the top here. I'm going to have vent holes at the top of the control box so that hot air will naturally rise up out of the control box. So yeah, I mean, from here it's looking great. I think what I'll do now is I'll try and put it into the control box to make sure it fits in as is. Like I said, there are some holes in the corners here that will need to have this bolted down to, to secure the board to the box. A couple of them might be tricky to get to, particularly this one. So what I'll probably do in that case is install the plastic acrylic sheet here after I've bolted it down. But you know, if you've got a nice sort of long socket piece, you can just do them up fairly easily from the outside. I'll turn it around for you as well. So you can see that I've essentially bolted everything on. I've got these big M10 nylock nuts here to hold those threads with some nice washers. Use bolts and nuts for everything. These don't protrude out too far either to hit the back of the enclosure. And I think this is the best way. Like I said, you know, if I need to take this out to service a part, I can just undo the bolts, replace something if I need to, without worrying about having to keep using screws in and out of this wood and that sort of becoming loose over time. So. I think this is definitely the best approach. So like I said, I'm gonna take you over to the box now and I'll try and install this thing. Right, so I'm at the control box here and I'm gonna try and show you as much as I can of this installation process. Like I said, I've bought two 80 millimeter fans, which happen to fit very nicely on the sides here of the enclosure. So I think that would be a nice entry point for some air to draw up from the bottom. Now what I'm gonna do in this case is drill out some holes. Then I'm gonna add a dust filter and place the fan on top because you really wanna keep dust out of this. In my case in particular, I'm so close to the machine. Uh, I'm eventually gonna hopefully put an enclosure around it, but you don't want any dust getting in here. Particularly with the power supplies, it can lead to heat issues in the future potentially. So I'm going to also drill some vent holes at the top. 
again with some dust filter material on there and that way we should have a nice natural airflow just up and out of the enclosure on the side I'm gonna have to drill some holes I'll have my switches here on the side my emergency stop and my toggle selector so there's some holes to drill in here so the wiring can come in and out I've also done the wiring from my consumer unit which is down below I've installed another 13 amp fuse in there so all this runs on its own breaker and I have the cable there ready for that I've decided to use shielded also so I've got shielded coming in from the mains all the routing and cabling between the different power supplies and breakers will all be shielded as well and obviously the VFD stuff is shielded too so what I'll do now is I'll try and just get that in there I'm not going to bolt it down but I just want to make sure it'll sit in there nicely that way I can do as much of the wiring as possible on the workbench then pop it in and finish the wiring between the switches and, and all that kind of stuff right okay so I have all the electronics here so as you can see I made the board as big as it can possibly be but it's not going to go in just straight back like that so what I've done is I've done it so that I can sort of hook it in you get that side in first then we can pop this around and you can see it literally just fall straight on uh, I'm not going to let that go obviously there because it'll fall forward but you can see that fits in there nicely I think it looks pretty good I might actually just try and get one bolt on if I can find it bear with me there we go so that's in there so you can see how easily I was able to just pop that straight in there and that's ideal like I said because if I ever need to get in here do any servicing of the parts I can just pull that whole thing out leaving this on the wall the downside is obviously I would have connectors on the side here going to all the wiring but if you know where they go you know it's nothing to, to pop those out of there plus again the benefit of these is that they pull out so I can take these out like this do the wiring pop them back in that's really beneficial and allows you to have them in this orientation I've left enough space between them so I can easily read the pin outputs here you could use a diagram but it's nice to see them for validation so you can see I've got everything I need in there to now get started doing the wiring so there's not a whole lot more to say there really I've got the connectors which are gonna be up here so ideally I'm gonna have a row for the X connections obviously the two Y motors and the encoders including the sensors as well and obviously the Z I'm gonna label all those nicely on the side so that when I want to hook them up to the unit just pop them straight in and it's ready to go there's some space here as well for additional boards in the start of the video I did show you this board here this is a relay board I'm probably not going to use a straight away but what this basically allows you to do is switch the inputs so because I have two y-axis motors the Mac 3 breakup board here comes with four axes that you can potentially use however if you want to have a fourth axis on the machine as in something on the bed uh, that can turn for example you would lose that by having a Y slave axis because you'd have to connect the fourth axis as your second Y motor however with one of these you can set the Y up to be a slave using a relay and just switch the output that way you can keep the fourth axis and still be able to use that in the future but I'll be setting that up in an additional video at the moment I just want to get all this working I want to get the communication with PWM from this board to this board coming from the VFD and basically I just want to get everything wired up make sure the machine is functional I'll run some tests at the end showing the thing moving around firing the spindle up and that is ultimately the goal so I got plenty to get on with now I'm gonna crack on with the wiring like I said I'll film what I can I don't know how sort of exciting wiring is but um, I'll see what I can do either way I'll come back and I'll show you the progress right guys so what I've gone and done here is taken the enclosure off the wall and I've actually drilled out all the holes required for my airflow and my cabling I didn't record much of that because honestly it's not that interesting it's just a lot of noise and mess 
But basically, I'll show you what I've done. So I've got a couple of my cables here. So these are the aviation connectors, which will come out the back. So if I turn this a little for you. So on the side here, at the top, I've got my aviation connectors. And basically, these simply will go through and pop in, but obviously be bolted in from the back. And they will go to the necessary connections on the electrical board. So I've got four at the top there for the encoder, which are gonna be these six pin outputs. So I've got loads of different connectors here. These ones have six pins, obviously for the encoders. These ones have three pins for the sensors, the limit switch sensors. And these ones here are for the motors, which have four connectors. So as I said, four encoders, four motors, and at the moment, four sensors, but I've left room underneath there in case I want to add more in the future. This one here is going to be the VFD output. I don't actually have the female side of the aviation connector for that yet. It's still on order, but I've drilled the hole anyway. These two at the bottom here are for my switches. So this is my emergency stop. This one here is my selector switch. I've drilled the holes necessary for the cabling to come in and out of those. To drill these holes here, these ones are not the cleanest of holes, but I actually had to use a regular drill bit. I'll actually show it to you. So this is an absolute monster of a drill bit. That's a 16 mil drill bit. So what I tried to do is work my way up to this. And the reason I had to do that is because I, I couldn't source a 16 mil hole saw bit anywhere. So I just had to make do with this. And the reason you need 16 mil, obviously, is because these here are a diameter of 16 millimeters. So I kind of couldn't do nothing about that. However, the larger holes here, I did with my nice hole saw bit. Um, worked a treat. This particular brand here goes through this like it's nothing. It's a really, really good tool. And what I like about this one is it's quick change. So you can have this bit in the drill, pull this back. You can actually swap out the bit really quickly. It's so handy. I'll leave links to that in the description if you're interested. So that's the cables and the interface in there. As I said, I didn't really record much of the cable stuff because I mean, it's just soldering wires. There's not a lot to say about it. I'm following the guides that I've done before and they're all just gonna connect to the board on the other side of these. One thing I will say is I've left a lot of cable here on the inside of this. A lot, probably three quarters of this is gonna end up getting cut off. But I didn't want to do all the soldering and then be too short. So I'd rather have more cable than I need and cut it than not have enough. So, you know, these are only going to need to go a small distance to the drivers there and it should be fine. What I've also done on the top here is I've put some ventilation holes for my airflow at the top. So I've got one of these vent covers here. I've made nice big holes. I am going to put a dust filter underneath here as well, just to stop dust potentially falling in. If I'm not using the CNC, for example, but I'm sanding in the workshop, dust goes everywhere, I'm sure you already know that, but you wanna protect it from dropping in as well. So I'm just gonna put one of these covers over with a dust filter underneath, and that should nicely allow airflow from the bottom, which I'll also show you. So I flip this upside down. All I've done on the bottom here is drilled the four holes to mount these 24 volt fans. I think they're 80 millimeter fans. These will go on the inside. So the idea is these are gonna draw cool air in, up through the enclosure, and naturally it'll vent out at the top. Again, I've also drilled large holes for these. I decided to go with larger holes just because it's easier and I'd rather do this than drill lots of tiny little holes that aren't really symmetrical and it doesn't look very good. 
this is going to be absolutely fine as long as air can get in and air can flow out you're sorted this here is my main power input and typically what you do for these i've shown you these before these are these glands when doing electrical installations i've deburred these holes here but generally you want to avoid cables coming into contact with direct metal or rubbing on them um, so what you tend to do is use something like this which has a plastic nut and a plastic thread here so you pop that through and then you thread it on from the back and that way then you feed your cable in here and you can tighten it down so it's a lot safer but that's basically where i am with the enclosure at the moment all the holes are drilled it's ready to be installed now you can see the fan mount on the bottom there and now it's just simply a case of installing that board doing all the wiring getting it back on the wall over there and we can start testing things out all right so there we go we've got the board mounted back in there now you can see everything's pretty much ready to be wired up i'm going to start putting on some of the outer switches uh, I'm going to do all the fixtures and stuff first. Then my plan to start with is to get all the power electronics done. I want all that to be clean and laid up correctly before I move on to any of the other stuff. So I'm going to get my vent cover on. I'm going to get my switches on. And then I'll get the power electronics all wired up, including the switches. And from there, then, I'm going to be placing these through. I'll just show you what I meant. So if I pop that in there, so basically I have a lot more cable than I need here, but it, it's going to be really neat. So each one of these cables is going to go to a different driver and I just need to mark out where it needs to be cut and then these can really neatly come straight in and be mounted to these blocks. And again, the great thing about these is they come out so I can go and connect them up over on the bench, make sure they're nice and secure, come back, pop them in and it's happy days. So I'll just have to do that a few times. And that is quite straightforward. And you can see now why having the quick disconnects is a massive advantage in my opinion, because if I ever need to disconnect the machine from the box, all this stuff is, is never gonna have to change. You know, as long as I don't physically wanna do any upgrades or anything like that, I can move this around. If I move in the future and the machine goes somewhere else, it's literally a case of unplug and plug it back in. I think that is ideal. I will try to monitor the heat and see how it goes, but you know, I don't think they're gonna get stupidly hot. It's a nice big enclosure. They're not, nothing's too crammed in there. I will monitor it, as I said, but I think we're gonna be okay. Right, so from here then, I'm gonna start the electrical wiring. I'll probably do as much as I can here on the bench before I put it back on the wall, just because it's easier. I got better light in here. It's gonna be easier to film as well. And it's not gonna break my back, trying to sort of lean in and see what I'm doing. Right, so just a quick update before I go ahead and do the power electronics. So I've cleaned up all the holes that were in the enclosure here, got rid of all the burrs. I've also added my switches on the side, so I've got my emergency stop down the bottom here. And I've got my two switches for the two different circuits I'm going to have. I've installed the vent at the top. I've got dust filters between the enclosure and the vent, and also the fans and the enclosure. So it's completely sealed up. It's starting to look really, really good. There's not an awful lot left to add in here, other than just wiring everything together, so super exciting. As I said, you know, it's really coming together. It's starting to look good now. Everything's fitted. It's nice to see it all in one place. And I'm going to go ahead and do the wiring now for the power electronics. I've got some spare solid core here from Twin and Earth. Uh, I've got my live and neutral, and obviously my Earth here, which I'm going to sleeve. So I'm just going to put a few terminal blocks in there, um, mostly for neutral and Earth and then wire all the lies up to where they need to go and the switches to the fuses and obviously to whichever device they connect to. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the wiring now and I'll run you through that once I've done it. So I started doing some of the early wiring in the box in the back for the switches and the emergency stop. Uh, I've taken this out for the moment because I'm looking to sort of see how I can most efficiently route the cables and keep it clean to have good airflow. 
So I'm actually going to route some cables from the back where I can because there's a bit of a standoff between the back of the casing and the back of the board here. So um, I have this cable here, for example, going to supply the Intel Nook. So this is going to just sit nicely up here. But then I'm running that big thick power cable down behind and then obviously I've cut the end off it to come through. And the beauty of that is this fuse here is obviously for the nook. I've isolated that. So all this wire needs to do is go straight into here. And that's really neat. You know, you've not got cables going everywhere. So I've then got these, which are all going to join the neutral and earth blocks. And these are going to be shared between lots of different components anyway. So what I'm thinking of doing is having some of these blocks here that I can fix to the board. So then all my earths and my neutrals can just go straight to wherever they need to go. That way it's going to be really neat. I can see where everything's going. I think it'll also make routing the microelectronics a lot more efficient as well because they're a lot smaller wires and they need to be kept neat. And they can sort of come down the side here, go to the VFD. A lot of them are just going to go between the main board and the drivers. But like I said, I want to do this in as presentable a way as I possibly can. I've always been this way anyway when I'm building PCs and that type of thing. So it's not going to be any different here. I like to do as good a job as I can, making sure it's safe and that it has good airflow. So that's what I'm going to do. There's going to be some cables, you know, from the mains and to the switches where you'll see a bit of cable in the front here, but that's, you know, that's fine. That's what it's for. As long as they're secure and safe, I'll cable tie and do all that kind of stuff to keep everything neat, but this is where I'm at at the moment. I'm going to drill a couple more holes here so I can route power straight up to the power supplies. So this fuse here, this 3 amp will supply this and this, so that can go behind as well. And then I've got another one here which is going to go to the VFD. And to be honest, I'll probably run that one just down and under because there's no room to come out underneath anyway um, and I want room on the side to route the microelectronic cables up so that's what I'm thinking at the moment right so I've now installed the necessary wiring in the housing here for the two switches I've got my switch outputs coming off there which are going to connect to the fuses and I've basically just done the earthing of the enclosure itself I've got the wiring for the fans already which is going to go up to the 24 volt supply and I am now in a position where I can mount this in there and I've done a lot of wiring here which I'll show you so I'm going to mount it in there and then come back and show you the rest. So here we go I've just installed the board back into the enclosure here and you can see it's all looking really good. I've tried my absolute best to do the wiring as neat as I can. So I've got the wiring going behind the board because I've got a good sort of 10 millimeter gap behind there because I put some standoffs, which means I can do the routing behind. Like I said, it's just going to improve airflow and keep this looking nice and tidy. All right, so it's a fresh day and I made a few changes to this yesterday since you saw the last update. So I'll run you through those quickly. The main one that you probably notice is I've now moved all the mains wiring to the front of the main board. I originally planned to route that around the back and have it be a lot neater, but I decided against that in the end because it just would make things more difficult in the future if I want to rewire something or add something. I don't want to have to pull the whole thing out just to change a couple of wires around. So I've put all the mains wiring in the front now it looks really neat i've been as clean and as careful as i can possibly be these are the two mains coming from the switch they obviously go into the fuses there but that's disconnected for now i have also powered this up and it works the power comes on to everything the emergency stop works the switches work and i'll show you that as well a bit later on but I'm really happy with it at the moment. I've, I've already started adding some of the wires up here for the drivers, as you can see. I've also added in 
Ethernet. So I mentioned before about potentially using Wi-Fi for my connectivity. That just seemed like a bad idea, honestly, when I was thinking about it, because I'll either have to get a USB extension and have a dongle sort of sticking out the edge here, or have a dongle inside connected to the nook and hope for the best. But I've got this long ethernet line around, so I didn't even have to buy this. So I thought, you know what? I might as well just add ethernet and that way I can remote to the nook. No problem at all. No lag, nothing is gonna be perfect. What I've done as well is for the nook, as I said, one of the things I want to do is never have keyboard and mouse or monitor or anything connected to the nook here. I drilled a little hole so I can turn it on, push the little button there. So the nook is situated in there. The power supply is next to it because obviously it comes with a typical, I think it's 19 volt laptop adapter type power supply. Um, that has about a three amp current at its peak. Likely never gets anywhere near that though. But basically all I've got plugged into the nook is the USB out to connect to the Mac 3 board obviously, which you can see here. There's the ethernet which goes directly in and there's also a display emulator. So there's a little HDMI out port on the NUC. Um, whenever you wanna use something like VNC to remote to the NUC, you actually have to use, you need some kind of display. If the machine has no display, when you come to doing the VNC stuff, it's just not gonna recognize it. It's just gonna be a blank screen. So. A display emulator is like two quid or something, they're really cheap. And it's just like a little Wi-Fi dongle type of thing, except it goes in the HDMI port. I've turned the knock on, I've set it all up. I can remote to it from my main PC in the shed here, which I do my CAD and all that stuff on. And it's brilliant. It's exactly what I need. It all is maintained in this unit. I don't need a, a screen, a keyboard, a mouse, anything like that. I can even remote to it with an iPad using real VNC, so it's ideal. And I'll, I'll demo that to you in a, probably another video. I'll show you how to set all that up. But it's really, really handy. And I think you'd agree, it, it looks quite nice and contained in there. It's in behind, so it's not getting in, in the way of any of the mainboard stuff. And it just works great. So I've got a vent installed on the top too, which I probably showed you in the last update, I can't remember. But we've got the fans on the bottom with dust filters all installed. I've got my blocks here. So this is my 36 volt power supply, which is only connected to the drivers here. So that's isolated power just for the drivers. And then I've got my 24 volt supply here, which connects to the main board and will then connect to each of the proximity sensors. So to make my wiring as neat as possible, I've added these little terminal blocks here, smaller versions of the ones I've used for earth and neutral on the mains. These ones have eight different connections out, whereas I think those ones have 16. But basically I've got a wire coming from my 24 volts up, I've got my positive 24 volt there and then my 24 volt ground. And there's another wire that powers the fans down here, which I've disconnected for now. Because I might add a little fan speed controller as well. At full speed, the fans are quite loud. But then again, it is a CNC machine. And whenever it's on, it's going to be loud anyway. So I haven't fully decided that yet. But on the top here, like I said in the prior tutorials, when we're connecting all the different drivers, I'm essentially piggybacking off this 5 volt out here. So I've got a 5 volt out from the board, which connects here. Then we have a 5 volt ground. And I'm just borrowing off those really to go to all the different connections where we've got the pulse direction. The spindle output wire is also here, which I am yet to hook up, but that part has arrived, which I was talking about before. So I've left plenty of cable there. This is shielded and it's all hooked up. I've used shielded cable wherever I can, even from the power here shielded. There's a big thick mains cable that goes in and that's just gonna connect on the back here. This one actually bolts on because it's quite a chunky connector. So I'm gonna hook that up as well. That's one of my next moves. And from there, all I've really got to do, all these different cable connections that I've made, 
And basically I need to root these in, bolt them down into place, and then these wires are gonna go to wherever they need to go on the drivers and also for the sensors as well. I think this one is a four pin, so that's the motor connection. Again, everything is shielded just to play it safe. So each one of these is gonna go to the four pin connectors there, which I showed you how to set up in the previous video. So I'm just gonna have to strip some of this back, hook it up to the blocks and put the blocks back in. And that shouldn't take me too long. And once they're all in, it's pretty much good to go. Um, I'm still working out how to set it up over by the machine. One of the things with this particular unit is with everything installed, it's very heavy. And I'm in a shed here, which isn't really a structural wall, if, if you know what I mean. So I don't add any unnecessary weight to the wall of the shed because it's obviously got nothing to counter that. The only other thing I could do is install some kind of brace down to the floor so that the ground can counter that weight, which is probably what I'll do. Failing that, it could go on the side of the machine on the stand like I've talked about before. I haven't decided yet and I'll get to that later. Alright guys, so here we are with the final update on this enclosure for this video. And this is where we've got to at the moment. Extremely happy with it so far. I've still got to tidy up a few cables and sort of zip tie them together so they're nice and safe but I've achieved my goal for the end of this video which is to have everything wired up have all the connectors in and the switches and be able to turn it on and have everything function correctly so as you can see on the bottom here I've completed the power electronics I've got my mains coming in at the bottom here which is why I've got this stood up so that it doesn't crush the cable underneath. That then feeds into my switches here, which go into the fuses, which obviously control the different circuits and the different devices in there. I've also managed to wire up all the microelectronics as well. So I think I gave you a brief overview of that in the last update, but I'll do it again anyway, so apologies if I'm repeating myself here, but I obviously have the four drivers here, and the Mac 3 breakout board. The Mac 3 board and the drivers have a 5 volt and a 5 volt ground here, which I'm piggybacking off to go into the pulse and direction pins on the drivers. So you can see they all come off there nice and neat into the correct spot. And the sensors which come in on the back here go to these 24 volt blocks. So we got positive from ground there which feeds the power for the sensors, but then we've also got the sensor inputs into the board. So the only other thing I have to investigate, which I talked about in my wiring video, is controlling the spindle via the Mac 3 board. And you can see I've installed this PWM to analog converter here. So this board outputs a PWM signal, which can be used to control the spindle speed programmatically or via software. However, you should convert that PWM signal to an analog signal because this VFD has an analog input that it's expecting from a device to control it. So I've added this little circuit here which we just feed in our PWM and then we have an output which will go into the VFD. That really shouldn't be too complicated but it's something I'm gonna have to test when I've got all the hardware hooked up and I can see what's happening. Like I said, overall, I'm really, really happy with this. I have those fans at the bottom. They pull in a lot of air, and I have a vent at the top here, which just naturally vents out, and there's a good amount of airflow through there, so I'm not worried about any heat or anything like that. The layout, I think, is optimal. I really thought about it for quite a long time. Having this standoff board here was a massive advantage, in my opinion, because I've got the nook in behind there which is exactly what i want i you know i don't ever really need to touch that i've got a hole here for me to turn the button on but once it's in there and operational that's all you need so i've got the usb obviously coming out of the nook into the mac 3 board and then i have an output at the back for ethernet 
so that I can remote connect into that board and be able to control it. That's basically it. It's, it's up and running. Everything's great. I can show you it turning on as well. So I have two switches here. The one on the right here will turn on the VFD. So if I switch that on, you will see the display light up there and it's ready to go. And the switch on the left controls the rest of the electronics, which will power up these power supplies and the drivers. And if I were to turn the nook on as well, you'd see power go into the board. But it's all in there. The drivers are obviously blinking at the moment because there's no motor connected to them. But it's in there, it's ready to operate. So we're really, really close now to actually testing this machine out. And in the next video, you will see this machine moving. As long as there are no real teething issues or major problems, which I don't think there will be because it's all gone to plan, it's looking very good. We should be in for a treat in the next video and I want to start running some G-code and doing some real solid tests and calibrating. Also as well, my emergency stop. You see if I hit that here, it'll cut power. Everything's gone off. You can see the error message there. That takes 20 seconds or so for the relay to, to trip off. But that works as well. And if I pull this back out, it all powers back up. So I'm really, really happy with the wiring. I've tried to do it as safely and as professionally as I can. Like I said in prior videos, I'm not an electrician, but I have a good understanding of it and what's safe and what isn't safe. So I've done my best there to do it. I've tested it. And I'm fairly confident that it's going to be absolutely fine. Nothing's exploded, nothing's blown up. But I will obviously monitor this as it's drawing current when we're using the machine. So I'll switch these back off now while the switch is there. I've spun this around here to give you a better look at the sort of I.O. I've got here on the side. My switches. And each of these needed a hole drilled for them. So all of these were 16 millimeter holes. This was a 20 millimeter hole. This was also a 20 millimeter hole, but you can see I've got a, a rubber grommet in there to protect the wire. There were 20 mil holes behind each of these as well for the cables to feed in and back out. And that's basically it. Like I said, emergency stop here. Switches to control the spindle and the rest of the electronics. These particular cables here, they have covers on them. So the bottom one, I've got a three pin aviation connector they're all aviation connectors but this one's three pin which will be the sensor the proximity sensor the one above it here is four pin which is the power delivery to the NEMA motors and the one above it is six pin which is the encoder data coming from the closed loop NEMA so each of these will be fed in for the different axis so for example this one is the X axis this is going to be Y1 Y2 and Z and it's Y1 and Y2 obviously because I have a motor driving each side of the Y axis. In your case you might not have that if you've done three then in that case you only need the three of them. I bought these connectors just in a little kit like this. The three pin, the four pin and the six pin. And I'll show you just a quick example. So this here is the male end of this connector and as you can see, as you can imagine it just goes straight in and you fasten it down and that would be my connector there for the z-axis encoder so what i need to do now is go and take this encoder extension cable wire those into this connector to the correct pins based on my pin labeling and it's important that you do that correctly otherwise they've all got to come off and desoldering these and reconnecting them is a lot more difficult than soldering them for the first time. So in that case, you might actually be better just buying new connectors because it's a bit of a pain soldering these. It takes a lot of time and it's quite a fiddly process. Same here, I have the motor connectors. So this goes into the motor end and then power to the motors is delivered through the four pin connector, which would just go in there. Same here for the spindle connector. I bought another one of these, and this is actually quite a high quality one. Same, same scenario, that'll just fit straight in there like that. Connect up, and the spindle will be connected to that directly. 
through my own shielded 4-core cable. In regards to the wiring and the pin numbers, what I actually did was I made these little tables here in Microsoft Excel which tell me the pin numbers and what colours I expect for each of the things. So, for example, let's take the motors. The motor has its own colours on the motor end, but the cable I've used to go from here to the drivers has its own colour in there. So you can see I've got black, green, red, blue on the extender cable, which you saw here, but in the box, it's actually black, green, red, white. So you need to make sure that they all correspond to the correct pin numbers. And I could provide that to you, but remember, if you're buying your own shielded cable, chances are it has different color internal core cables. So you need to look at that and make sure that's all correct. You may have also noticed there's a little hole that I drilled here, which I am keeping for a fan speed controller. So the, the fans I put on the bottom, 24 volt, they are very noisy and they shift a lot of air. So potentially, I've left the door open to install a fan speed controller. Just a little potentiometer connected to a little circuit board, um, which would allow me to dial them back if I wanted to. But like I said prior, a CNC machine is loud anyway. So if you're bothered about fan speed, you're probably gonna be bothered about this or you're probably building the wrong machine, right? So. It might not even be an issue, but I've done that there ahead of time just in case. If I don't use it, I'll just plug it with a grommet and we're all good. So there we go, that's a brief update here of my enclosure and my wiring. Like I said before, this was never going to be a video where I show you where every single wire goes. I did show you how to wire the NEMAs the closed loop nemas I showed you how to wire up the spindle in the prior video so be sure to check that out and when you're wiring this all up it's literally a case of just doing that four times over really for each driver going to the right pins and ports as I emphasize all the time it's the power electronics that you need to be extra careful with and make sure that it's done correctly and safely otherwise you're going to end up blowing fuses or damaging consumer units potentially if you don't have fuses but yeah, like I, like I always say, make sure you get that checked out and signed off by somebody. So there we are guys, that's an update on the CNC enclosure here that contains all the wiring and electronics. This was a very time consuming process. It's an ambitious thing to do, particularly if you're not very sort of electrically minded or have a good understanding of electronics. It took me a good few weeks to plan this out figure out all the things I need, all the fixtures, even things like the standoffs here with the acrylic sheet that has the Intel nook underneath it. All that stuff took time to plan out and you kind of get started and then you have new ideas and you think of things that would be better. So it was a bit of a process of trying things, figuring out things in a better way and ultimately this has been the end result. The main goal of this video is for you to see my process and maybe pick out a few things that you think might be useful for you. So I'm not saying you have to do it like this, this is just how I did it. So you might have better ways of doing it, there may be things I've done that you don't need or don't want and that's completely fine. That's the whole point of a DIY project, right? You do it in the way that you want to do it. I didn't record every single part as you've probably seen, I didn't record the soldering or me putting all the different connections in just because it takes so much time and over Christmas with visiting family and I was a bit unwell over Christmas too so you can see what's going on here like I said I've shown you how to wire the motors the drivers and the spindle and all that good stuff so there we go that's the video where do we go from here well we test it that's the truth of it so it's done now all I need to do is create the other end of these connectors. So this is the female end. I now have to create the male end of those connectors, which have the extension wires connected to them from the motor. Plug them in and start testing. I'll test them initially on the bench here. So I'll hook everything up, put everything out on the bench, test Mach 3, make sure all the sensors are working, make sure the motors are communicating with the drivers. And then from there, 
I'll install the motors onto the machine and we will try and move the machine around. So I'm super excited for that. And the next video, you will definitely see this machine in action. So there we go. I hope you're having a great week and a great start to the new year. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all the support. Come and join the Discord channel. Support me on my website if you'd like to. I'd really appreciate that. And we'll keep going with this build. We're nearly there. And I will be sharing the files very, very soon. So stay tuned for that. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.